Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. Hello, and welcome to Galveston Unscripted. The conversation in this episode is to give a little bit more content and context to one of the landmarks on the map. I sat down with Doug McLean to talk about his statue, Hope, located at 26th Street and Sealy Avenue. Doug McLean is an accomplished sculptor, artist, and blacksmith. Doug has lived on the island for more than 40 years. He has been involved in countless restoration projects throughout Galveston, including the restoration of historical buildings, homes, and statues. If you've been on the island for more than a few hours, the chances are high you've seen something he's fixed, restored, or built. We cover quite a bit in this episode. We talk about Pompeo Capini and the original statue that inspired Doug's work. We had a lot of fun discussing the mystery of the original sculpture and how Doug was able to bring it back to life using only two photographs of Capini's Victims of the Galveston Flood sculpture. Pompeo Capini has works all over the U.S., but the majority of them can be found in Texas. One of his most notable works is a centigraph in front of the Alamo. Doug and I discuss a little bit more than the Hope statue. We discuss life on the island, the Galveston community, the 1900 storm and other major hurricanes, why Galveston is so different than other places, and that indescribable feeling of just loving living here. And without further ado, let's jump right in with Doug McLean and our conversation on the sculpture, Hope. Where did you grow up and how did you end up in art and sculpture? I grew up in Syracuse, New York, upstate New York, which is two hours from the Canadian border. I played sports. I was in football, skied a lot, and went off to college. My first semester in college, I took a sculpture class, and that was sort of the beginning of it. I completely was consumed by the whole idea of making art and just kept doing it. So I had four years of college, and well, as an art major, I also went to Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine, which was a real transitional period of time, and came down here in 1977, knowing some friends that had lived in Galveston, and came here one night, visited on a Friday night. They had a loft on the strand facing the bay, so I came into this beautiful, wonderful loft. The building was built in 1878, and I looked out these 16-foot-tall windows, looking over Galveston Bay, watching the ships go come in, and walked out the next morning. I'm, I'm in the middle of this complete transformation into Victorian America. Uh, this just The cityscape was just something I'd never had imagined. I did not know what Galveston was. And that was sort of the beginning of it. I moved here two weeks later, quit my job, came down here without any prospects and started over. So it was great. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. What'd you do first? What What was your, some of your jobs? Uh, I worked for a contractor. I worked for a mason. I worked with a bunch of crazy folks and did that for about a year and a half. I worked actually on the art center, installing the hardwood floor in the art center. Actually, I was working on that job, walked across the street after work to get a beer in front of the Emporium, which used to be on the Strand. And they had these big old whiskey barrels with tops on them and people sit there after work. That's when I went over there one day, sat down, and this guy came and sat down next to me, six foot six bearded guy from San Francisco. And he hired me that night to work with him on the Alyssa, which was pretty cool. And that was just purely by chance. And I'd hit four years of architectural drawing in college. So I had a lot of experience drafting and he hired me so I could help draft the rig for the ship. And then it kind of transitioned from there. Well, how long did you work on the Alyssa? I think it was about four and a half years, something like that. Love it. Yeah. And it was from when it was literally just a, an iron hull that had just gotten back from Greece and it was out at Duval Sulphur. I think it was Pier 41. And that's where we started. That was before there was any rig. There were no decks. It was just literally a steel hull. So that was cool to watch the whole thing transform from that phase to sailing the ship to New York in Operation Sail in 1986. And, you know, I mean, it's so cool. (laughs) It is amazing. It's an amazing ship. So I want to transition over to your sculpture, the Hope Statue. How did the Hope Statue come to be for you? I had just finished completing a commission for uh, J.P. Bryant, owner of the Bryant Museum. And he asked me one day if I'd be interested in maybe looking at another project. And he showed me the photographs of the Copini sculpture, uh, Victims of the 1900 Storm. And he wanted. He was very interested in me seeing if I could reproduce it. And I was really intrigued by it. And I had done, this would have been this third commission I'd done with him. And he was wonderful to work with. 
when he brought it up to me, I was really interested. I was completely overwhelmed by the woman's face in the sculpture. And I was really drawn to it for that reason as much as the sculpture itself. But the sculpture was done in 1904 at the request of city leaders in Galveston to commemorate the loss of six to 10,000 lives who'd been lost in the 1900 storm. And they commissioned Copini to develop a model, a maquette, for the proposal. And when he did, he brought it to the city fathers and they were just it was too much for them. They just thought it was too soon after the storm. People's, it was just too stark a memory, too harsh a memory for mm. them. And it's a definitely a thought-provoking image when you see it. You can't help but feel an emotional connection to it. And I decided for my own benefit, I wanted to do just the woman's face. Part of the reason for that is when I was 1964, I was 10. We went to the New York State World's Fair and walking through the sculpture pavilion, we were on this tramway that was kind of moving sideways, and it stopped in front of this giant sheet of glass. And behind the glass, about six feet behind the glass, was Michelangelo's Pietà. I was, this 10-year-old kid was just completely transfixed by it. It was her face. It was the expression in her face and the compassion and everything that was in there. So that, when I made the connection with that to Copini's work, I was really interested in trying to trans see if I could, if I could capture that sort of emotion um, that was in the woman's face. So I really only started with her basically from the neck up, partial shoulders and her, and her head. And um, when I got that done, I just sort of felt like, you know, there's a whole story behind here. The sculpture was lost. Oh, I think it was 1914 was the mm -hmm. last time it was ever seen. It's never been recovered. So there's these photographs that exist, and there's only two of them that I know of that are actually the finished work, which was never in bronze. It was in plaster. So in those two pictures, uh, anybody who's ever worked three-dimensionally, you have two pictures from 360 degrees. It doesn't give you a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Both of them were from the front quarter. There was no way that anybody could ever do a copy of it because it couldn't. you just couldn't achieve that. So I got inspired to do it and um, just to put the face to the story. And I had, when I had first gotten involved in sculpture in 72, I was doing figurative work and portrait work. And that evolved into more contemporary work and working in steel and iron, and uh, which has actually been what I've been working in for the last three decades. All this sort of allowed me to go back to where I started in sculpture and what really got me in the beginning. And it's, uh, it's really been rewarding. Uh, it's been a great return, and it's been a lot of fun. Wow. How long did it take you to complete, and what were some of the challenges <laughs> that, from start to finish, what were some of the challenges that you came across? <laughs> oh, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> uh, it's very tough. Um, the composition is complicated. It's three figures, actually four. There's a... a a woman carrying a child with her daughter clinging to her waist, going through horrific weather, rain pelting them, winds, 100 mile an hour winds, climbing over the rocks and the winds, the surface breaking around them. And there's a, a sort of disengaged arm that reaches up out of, the, out of the surf towards whatever it can grasp. So it's, it's a distressing image, but I... What I tried to achieve with the woman's face, and I think Copini did too, is there's that parental sense of protection of your children. You'll do anything. There's hope in your mm -hmm. in your eyes no matter what happens. You're going to try and get through it. So I think that was the, the real true challenge was to achieve that. I mean, some people will say I did. Some people will say I didn't. But um, I tried to be respectful to what Copini did, but knowing that there was no way I th that I could copy it, you know, I made it mine, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was a different scale, so it was never going to be the size of Copini's. I could never have afforded to do it. And as it was, I think I think total hours I had about, it was over 2,000 man hours. Wow. I know that. It was, so it was two, one whole solid man year of, of labor. Wow. That was uh, divided over about a three-year period. And it was many late nights because I got really into it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a, it's a lot of hours for a passion was, project. Yeah, but I was doing 20 hours, yeah. you know, yeah. back to back. Mm -hmm. It put me in the hospital. It could have killed me, but, you know, it was that that's sort of how dedicated I was to, to the whole process. And uh, 
really to getting it right because I wasn't going to I wasn't going to be satisfied until it was right. And people who know me know that I will sacrifice a lot to get things right. <laughs> How does the sculpture relate to Galveston's resilience and the island community that has really been living here and thriving here for well over a century? Well, I think to live on on the island, you sort of got to be half crazy, to be honest with you. I think uh, you got to have a faith just being here that things will be okay. Everybody that lives here knows the history. They're well-schooled in it. Everybody knows the drills come June, July, and August, what we got to fear. But knowing the 1900 storm, the 1915 storm, Carla, Ike, all the storms, we all survived. We kept moving on, and we helped each other out. And I think that's a key to the sense of community here that's so so engaging is that during those periods of crisis, you find out that the people down the street you never knew could be the you know, could be the best friend you ever mm -hmm. had, you know, and everybody was helping other people. Class and race didn't mean mm -hmm. anything. It's sort of those barriers dropped. Mm -hmm. And every, you know, you'd stand in the line at the grocery store for three hours waiting to get a bottle of water. But everybody would be asking each other how they're doing, you know, yeah. how bad did they get it? And it's so it's this really amazing sense of community that you just you don't get anywhere else. And the geographic limitations of the island really sort of force everybody to live together, Yeah, um, which is interesting. Do you think it's the hurricanes that bring such a sense of community here in Galveston? Or do you think that's something else that Galveston has that's intangible? The island has this really amazingly rich history, cultural history, business history, commerce, everything else. And it's you know being the Wall Street of the Southwest in the mid-1800s or late-1800s, um, it really truly was just Wall Street. I mean, this is where that this was the center of trade and commerce for the whole southwestern U.S. There seems to be a level of respect that the upper class never lost for the working class. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's I'm sure there are people who will argue with me about that. But uh, there was a sense of community that we're kind of all in this together that mm -hmm. I, I don't think you have in a big city. I think it's wonderful. I mean, when I had when I first moved down here and the idea of raising a family came up, I I really liked the idea of raising kids in a multiracial environment where they were going to go to school with every mix and Absolutely. they were is you know the score was even. I am so glad that I did that. Mm. They've got friends from every walk of life, and and I I attribute that to growing up in an area like Galveston. Absolutely, and, um, it's it's a great place. It's a very unique place. It's also artistically too. It's been a great spot. There's been a lot of well-known American artists who have landed here, and uh, for one reason or another, usually cheap studio space. But a lot of New York artists found out about Galveston, came down here. The f that studio space that I told you about visiting mm -hmm. when I the first day yeah. I was here. Three months later, I actually rented that, and it's a 1,200 square foot loft with a 16-foot ceilings. It was a big open space. It was, well, 1,200 feet, but it also had an elevated loft and half, loft and half of it. Uh, hardwood floors, beautiful old antique windows. It was $125 a month. Oh, my gosh. You know, yeah. so these, a lot of artists from New York would come down here, and many of them stayed for a long period yeah. of time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that was, I mean, that was what attracted me here. Absolutely. The chance, hey, I can finally make art in a place yeah. I can afford in an old historic community. How can you beat it? I do want to ask you one question about, it's about the role of women in the Galveston community in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Actually, Galveston's pretty remarkable in that sense. Galveston, going way back, they were actually, the, the women were actually the one who developed the entire governmental structure. They wrote it out. They defined what it was going to be. They created the city council. It mm -hmm. was really the women who who engaged with the other women to come up with something that was going to work for the whole community. Mm -hmm. And they've always had that role. And since I've been here in the 40 years since I've been here, there's been some incredible matriarchs in this town, whether they be from strong, powerful families or they've arrived here and found this to be a community they wanted to work with. We've had some incredible women that mm -hmm. have worked here, and I've been honored to be very good friends with a lot of them. I just don't know of many communities that there's such an equal equal representation. Absolutely. All right. So is there anything you want to tell us about the Hope Statue that you may not have told anyone else in any other interview? <laughs> because I know you've done a few of them, quite a few of them. But is there anything that, that stands out in your mind or you hope that people take with them whenever they see your statue? 
Well, that's that's a good question. I think what I wanted to show there's there's several different issues. You've got this hand that's reaching up. Will that person survive? I didn't want to give that away. There's a good chance that person doesn't survive. The young child was the daughter clinging to her mom's waist. The, the photographs never showed a face. There's no image that I that I ever saw that anybody ever has shown me or anybody else that shows the girl's face. Mm -hmm. I had to show some of her face. So there's a little bit of her face peeking out. Yep. That was me. Yep. I, you know, uh, But I didn't want to have her with no identity at all. The little baby I worked a lot on. And I've told the story before. Mm -hmm. I did the baby's nose nine times. Mm -hmm. And I kept coming in and I didn't like it. And, you know, and I'd yep. work on it and I'd work on it. The ninth time, I walked in in the morning and looked at it. And I just reached up and took my thumb and just took her nose and took it right off the face, wow. right off her face. <laughs> it's like, okay, start over. And I finally got it. But the what I was trying to achieve in the baby's face was because there's speculation the baby was dead. Mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. like that. My father was an obstetrician and gynecologist and delivered like 16,000 kids oh, in 35 goodness. years. And the idea of my me sculpting a dead child, I just, you know, it, just, it, it you. wasn't cool. Yeah. So I wanted the child to look as though it was at peace. Mm -hmm. Having through, you know, having kids myself and holding those kids in my arms. And I, I carried my daughter into Carlsbad Cavern on my, oh, wow. in my arm. And she fell asleep on the way in and slept for an hour and a half all the way on my arm. And that child was so peaceful and had no idea the pain she was imposing on her father. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but so I wanted to, to imply that, that sense of peace that the child, whether alive or not, was at peace in the arms of its mm -hmm. mother. And, that was, and the mother was her complete and total dedication to making sure her kids survived. I think it's that uh, you just don't give up hope. You just mm -hmm. have to keep, you have to persevere through whatever it is. And uh, it just, that's what the island really has shown. That's what their character of the island is, is that we don't give up. And we'll, we'll get through it. Can you tell me a little bit about Pompeo Copini and some of his works before or after this statue? Copini was an immigrant from Italy. He moved here. I think he immigrated here in, I believe it was 1887. I might be wrong about that. Um, he lived into the 50s, I believe. But he came here and began working. In, he had a studio in San Antonio for about 15 or 20 years. And he had a uh, an assistant whose name, Tausch, I believe is her name. He, and she was an exceptionally talented sculptor. She did a lot of his work for him, which was true for a lot of great sculptors in history. They usually had very, very uh, talented craftsmen working with them and artisans that they could guide and, mm -hmm. and direct. Um, so Copini was no different. But he was a perfectionist. He wouldn't allow her to ever date or marry. If she was wow. going to work with him... She was never going to have any other interests. Oh, wow. And that was a precondition. Mm -hmm. And she never did. She never married. So Copini did this. He, was, he did the Littlefield Fountain in San Antonio. He did hundreds of sculptures around the state. Very traditional, very Italian influence, yeah. figurative work. A true craftsman. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I admire him, but I really didn't know anything about him when I started this. Yeah. I wasn't intending to try and rip off... Pompeo Copini. Mm -hmm. That's not how it started by any means. But I just got, it was my own, I was fueled by my own interest in trying to see if I could achieve it. Absolutely. And the more I did it, the more I realized I had to do it. And why I felt like I had to do it, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the unending support of my wife, Joyce, who never gave up on me and my kids for putting up with me, I was able to get it to the point where I felt like, okay, Let's, let's, let's cast this. It's, yeah, let's, it's done. Let's cast this girl. Yeah. So, so where go. where was it cast? And what is it? Uh, what are the materials it's made of? It's made of silicon bronze mm -hmm. that was cast in Smithville. Mm -hmm. Omega bronze in Smithville, Texas. And terrific foundry, exceptional craftsmen. I would highly recommend them, but they're very busy. Mm -hmm. But it's a great setup. Going up there was an experience. They came actually. They came down because Hope was seven feet tall and and made out of clay. Transporting her two hundred miles was going to be a, an iffy proposition. Mm -hmm. um, so they agreed to come down here and pull the mold, which is a silicone mold, mm -hmm. 
take the mold back to Smithville and uh, reassemble it and pour the cast bronze. When it was poured, they had to separate it. And then they brazed all that together, did all the finish work, and I cannot find a single seam that these guys... I, I, I mean... If anybody could find the seams where they put the mold together, I'd be able to do it. I can't find Beautiful. one. Wow. Um, so that's pretty impressive. And then to go up there and, and work with them to get the patina right. Mm-hmm. And and the fun part is to watch the patina change completely from what it was six months ago. Wow. Just from the salt air. So it's already getting a green tinge, which mm-hmm. we knew was going to happen. I've been looking forward to it because now it's starting to get some age to it. Yeah. And it looks like it's been exciting. there 100 years. Well, not quite. <laughs> How was the original sculpture lost? And what is the story behind that? Because I know it was originally made for the city of Galveston. The city fathers thought it may be too intense uh, initially. And then it was sent to a World's Fair. Sent to the New York... Oh, St. Louis World's Fair Mm -hmm. in 1908. And it was intended to be the the highlight of the sculpture exhibition, Mm -hmm. sculpture pavilion. Well, they mislabeled the crate and it went to the Texas Pavilion. Mm -hmm. And the Texas Pavilion was made up the interior to look like a, a, a mansion. And mm-hmm. then the sculpture was about three inches from the ceiling and was just not appropriate for where it was. But instead of being the centerpiece of the sculpture pavilion, it was stuck in the middle of this room in the Texas pavilion. Yeah. So it was shown there, then came out. And I think the story was there were some students who had found the sculpture stored in some warehouse. And this was, again, in plaster. And nobody knew what it existed, so the students... Where were these students? They were at University of Texas. Okay. And they found this and were so intrigued by it and impressed by it that they convinced the the art department to show the work again. So Mm -hmm. I think, I believe it was 1918, the work was exhibited for the last time, Mm -hmm. and it went back into storage, and it's never been found again. Is there a chance that it could be hiding in someone's garage somewhere? Uh, I doubt it. Plaster doesn't hold up real well. Especially if it's in a damp environment yeah. or a, a real hot, damp environment, it's yeah. not going to last. And gotcha. whatever the armature is, if it's steel, the steel inside of it, mm-hmm. the plaster's absorbing the moisture, the moisture gets through to the metal, the metal expands. Yeah. So it'd be great if it was. And if it ever is discovered, then I'll know how much I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least yours ended up in Galveston. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. What are some of your favorite stories, moments in Galveston history? Fun stories. When I was working on the restoration of the Alyssa, we had to have a figurehead carved. This was real critical. The figurehead on a, on a historic ship, 1800s, was usually the daughter of the shipbuilder or some very prominent person in the, in the family of the, the shipbuilder, the ship owner. We don't have any images that, of the original ship. We do have some originals, but they don't show the figurehead. So we had to come up with a model of some kind. Well, how are we going to do this? Well, we had a young girl who was an A&M student, Texas A&M Maritime. She was on the volunteer crew. The chief rigger, who was the six-foot-six bearded guy from San Francisco, thought that she would be the perfect figurehead model. So they hired this sculptor named Eli Kozlinski from from New York. And Eli had been a part of uh, South Street Seaport in New York and was a sculptor and carved in wood and everything. And he was the perfect guy to do it. So Eli came down here and he said, well, you know, I can't just see her. We're going to have to work this out and so that I get this composition right. So what they did is, of course, Steve, who's the chief, chief rigger, said, okay, let me handle this. He figured out how to take this young 19 <laughs> or 20-year-old girl and literally strap her to the front of the ship with ropes tying her arms back behind her. And I'm not kidding, round the bow of the ship. Not only did he convince the powers that be that were paying for all this that this was a legitimate request, also convinced this young girl that she was going to allow herself to be strapped on the front of this ship. And Eli took a whole series of photographs of it and sketches and everything else and took those back to his studio on the Strand and and carved the figurehead and it is absolutely beautiful for it. So it was it was a great story, great event to be be there for with a great outcome. So, so that's the figurehead we see today. That's the, the figurehead. I love it. <laughs> what do you enjoy most about living here? I like the diversity. It was the second week that I was in town. I get it was Easter Sunday. And I knew somebody that invited me to go to somebody's house for brunch on Easter Sunday. 
And I show up at this very nice house and in a nice part of, of the island. And there's all these, there were probably 20, 25 people there who were the most wonderful, delightful, down-to-earth, fun, smart, just people. And it was, it was great. And I came to find out that they were, they were artists, they were doctors, they were lawyers, they were, they were scientists and researchers and everything else. I felt as though I were their, were their equal. Mm -hmm. I was relating to these people like we were all good friends and mm -hmm. they treated me the same way. And I'm friends with probably 70% of those people to this day. Wow. It was just something, something very, very special about the integration of when you have the university and all the doctors and all the scientists, you have this amazing intellect that comes together. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot of people that have moved on to other places, but the personalities and the intellect and the information and communication that you can gain in this town is so unlike any other because you're seeing them in the restaurants, you're seeing them at the, you know, at the corner store, you're yeah. seeing them uh, at the different festivals, mm -hmm. they're on a committee with you, they're on some commission with you, you know, you get involved. Yeah. People are very much involved in the town. Absolutely. And, um, so I, I, it's that sense of family that, that I've got here that I've never felt anyplace else. One thing that I did want to do is I wanted to take the chance to thank Christine Hopkins because she she came on to try and help us raise awareness of the sculpture, and she was just amazing. I, every time I turned around, we were getting copied on something else, that some other news, news media that had picked it up. It's really amazing to see somebody with that kind of skill, what they can do when they have a, a goal in mind, and she, she was just great. I would recommend her her assistance to anybody who might need it. One of the people that I'd like to thank probably more than anybody would be uh, my really good and dear and longtime friend, Robert Lynch, who I first met 40 years ago on the Alyssa. Over these four decades, we've become very, very good friends. And he's, he's always been a, a great motivator for me and a great supporter. His moral support has been just absolutely irreplaceable. And uh, so I want to thank him a lot. And, and also my children and my brothers and sister and all the, all the folks in town who've known me and been supporting me. I want to thank you all. Well, Doug, thank you so much for being my first guest on Galveston Unscripted. Hey, Jared, thank you so much. I appreciate it. For more information or to support this project, visit the link in the show notes below. For historic resources or more information, check out the episode description. <laughs>